Hi, this is Tino with Bluesy News. I'm sitting here with Tony Bronigal. I'm the I'm the go-to guy for 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 recording here and a lot of projects. Not the only guy that brings things in here. Can we go back to your career. You've had a long career, uh, yeah. mostly here in. Uh, you're originally from Houston. I'm I'm originally from Houston, Texas. I grew up playing all the joints back there. That's really what. That's really how I came up. Was playing like the joints, the blues and R&B joints, and ghetto or not, you know. And then I left there, 71, and moved to New York for a while and tried to rough it up there for a while. It was a lot of fun. It was very exciting. Back to Texas for a short stop off, and then I was offered an opportunity to go to, uh, well, no, during that period from New York, I went on the road with Johnny Nash for about a year and made, we made a record together. And it eventually got released. And I moved back to Texas for a brief spell, and then I was asked to go to London to work uh, for Island Records. And I went over there kind of as a, a studio rat. And uh, I was I was in London for five years. My It was about the first year was the only time I worked exclusively for Europe, for Island. After that, I would work, you know, some different projects for him, but not as exclusive as when I first moved there. And then I got in, into a band called Backstreet Crawler. Paul Kossoff, when Free broke up, Paul Kossoff started his own band, called Backstreet Crawler, and I was in that band. Paul, we made two records with Paul alive, and then Paul passed, and we made two records without Paul, and did pretty well, and started touring the United States with uh, with some big acts. Um, that was back in the late 70s. And then, 79, I got kind of homesick, came back to the States, moved out here in 79, and oh, I hooked up with Eric Burden right away, whom I'm still working with some live, I produced three records on him since 2002. Wow! And I hooked up with Ricky Lee Jones. I've just recently spoke to her again, and uh, we might be getting together on something in the near future. And then I started, you know, becoming a touring musician and Bette Midler for a summer. Then I joined Bonnie Raitt in '84, and I stayed there till about '91 or something like mm. that. Was there through the Grammys and the early Grammys, the first ones. Then I can just continued doing studio work uh, as a as a musician, as a drummer. And 93 started with um, Taj Mahal. And the first record was with some of these people. <laughs> so we go all go back a long ways. And then the second record was kind of a little bit more of an established group of people around Taj. Uh, the first one was Dance in the Blues. The second one was Phantom Blues. And by the time we reached Senior Blues with Taj, which was our third record, we pretty much had a set group. And that's been called since then the Phantom Blues Band. And this is kind of the Phantom Blues band camp here. Uh, so we make our records here, and we make other people's records, and sometimes we change some of the personnel. Taj on and off, live, in recording. We did a live record, Shoutin' and Key, which uh, I produced the live record. That won a Grammy. Senior Blues won a Grammy. The other two before were nominated. Then we did a fifth record, half of it here, with Taj, uh, called Maestro. Now we're working on something new with him. Nice. And I got a new thing that's it's gonna be really, really interesting. Curtis Salgado, we've done we're on our third record with Curtis Salgado. Anybody out there in the blues world knows Curtis. He's won a number of blues music awards since we started when he since he came down here to work with this team. I also produced a, a band out of Kansas City called Trampled Underfoot. We I made two records with them and their last record won contemporary blues record of the year as well. You know, we just keep it churning. It's kind of a I hate to use the word mill because people think it's like you're just, you know, sucking it up and regurgitating out the same thing or whatever, but we don't. We really spend the time to make it right. It does have a certain sound and a quality here, and it's got a vibe, and the musicians are very creative. And when we get back here into this little, we call it man cave, but we allow women in it. Mm. We get it We get it done, and it sounds really good coming out here. It always transfers into good sounding records coming out of here. There's a lot of experience in the ears of everyone on here. So it, it, it's There's a lot to say about the environment as well. Yeah, absolutely. And we've created a really good one here. Nice. And we're all really relaxed with it. And we love coming to work here. And we work hard here and we get a lot of work done. People come, people like to come here and work. You know, we've had artists that say, no, I want to go to the garage. You know, <laughs> produced a German record here last January. And I said, yeah, before they came to tennis, well, shall I book a big, bigger studio? And he went, no, we want to come to the garage. We want the garage experience. Wow, nice. So it was really cool that we got that we brought them in here because it kind of gives it a story as well, you know. Um, so for anybody who thinks recording is 
is slowed down, it's quite the opposite. Man, it's it's so funny because uh, uh, I was on a session in Amsterdam last year, and one of the people that was sitting there, one of the friends, said, "It seems very rare now that all you musicians play together. Usually, it's one at a time." And I go, I said, "That's most other people's sessions, but on my sessions, everybody plays as much as we can. I mean, in some days we have." Let's just recently we had two keyboards, guitar, bass, two horns, and the lead singer all singing at one time. Oh wow, nice. The separation nice. is kind of you have to mess with it a little bit and some things will be redone because of that, but we get the whole vibe of that just going right then. You like uh, the yeah. overdubs to be as much live I focused. personally do. I think it shows in the music. And yeah. you know, I'm not trying to make some kind of thumping pumping pop music here. Right. I'm trying to make music here right. that, that fills the void of, of all the indie and all the Americana and all the blues fans and what they're looking for. So that, that's that's what we're after here. Well, Tony, I'm, I'm a native of Los Angeles and I've okay. been in the music industry 23 years and this is LA's best kept secret here. Yeah, okay, uh, great. Okay. But you're definitely the, the go-to guy with a project. And, yeah, yeah. And I re- your, pro- your production style is very similar to like Alan Parsons who likes to record everything. Sure. Yeah. Live. It's old school. It's definitely old school thinking. All of the years that I've, when I first became a producer, it was just kind of a mental thing. I want to produce. I want to produce. And, and people go, what? You know, like they look at the drummer like, oh, he wants to produce, you know. And like, and I went, no, I want to produce. I, I understand. Some I of the best ears. producers are drummers. There's quite a few. There's quite a few. Butch Vig. Butch Vig. Tom Hambridge is, you know, naturally. He's got a similar situation to this. There's a lot, lots of producers. Producers make, drummers make good producers because drummers count everything off, make everything have a pace, make everything have an atmosphere, drive everything forward, and listen more than people think they do. Great drummers do. I mean, good drummers. And so when you, when you get that mind where you're really playing the music and communicating with everyone and helping everyone else communicating by punctuation, by dynamics, uh, by pace, by groove, by pocket, then you are kind of, I subtly use the word manipulating. You're not really manipulating, you're gathering and focusing by doing that. And that's kind of how I did it. Once I lear- decided to do it, I went, it's a matter of going in and turning on the light and getting everything started, and then also be the last one there to turn off the light, because you gotta finish it, you know, you have to finish it. In situations like this, and in most, especially when artists are writing their own songs, I spent a matter of a few months before the project. In pre-production. Yeah, just getting the songs in the head so you know you're going to get the right angle with those. When you end up with a finished, mastered product, is it often what you've heard before you even start it? Did you achieve what you want, or does it get on a magic of its own that... It gets a magic of its own most of the time. Nice. Uh, I I don't... I mean, there, there are times where I know that I really want it to be this way, and I might angle it toward that more but for the most part in this situation with these types of artists and these types of songs i like to get the magic that happens in the studio because usually what happens is it's better than i thought it was going to be so you have a long history with michael finnegan yeah mike and i've known each other for uh 30 years uh and we've worked together in different incarnations different bands we had a band together many many years ago called the normal adults and there was hmm. nothing normal about him. Johnny Lee was actually in that band, Ivan Neville, Hutch Hutchinson. And it was kind of like some Bonnie Raitt band members of that period and then some different people. And Mike was one of those, and Marty Grab and Ivan Neville. And um, that band was a long time. I mean, it never really got anywhere. It never really manifested completely. And But Mike and I have been friends for all, all, all these years. And then when we started... Mike, at one point, we were Phantom Blues Band was out with Taj Mahal, and we needed a keyboard player. And we'd been through a few, few, diff, few different keyboard players, and and we went, well, let's give Mike a shot to go out with us on this next run, and he did. Of course, everything went really well, and we really enjoyed playing with Mike. And when we decided to, when Taj decided to come off the road, we decided to adapt the name Phantom Blues Band, which he in fact gave us in the beginning, and so we stayed with this lineup of. Of Johnny Lee and Mike Finnegan and Larry Fulcher on bass and myself, Daryl Leonard and Joseph Bled on horns, the Texacali horns, and we've kept this same lineup of the six same six people. Nice, nice. And um, yeah, and Mike's a great singer, fantastic singer. We have him singing about half of our songs, and the other half are Larry and Johnny. It's a very much an ensemble type situation, very democratic. Nice. Band of blues band, check them out. We're gonna make a new record soon. Too. You will in 2015. Yeah. 
Yeah, we're talking about it. Nice. Tony, it's been such a pleasure oh, thank you. Uh, finally meeting you. You too, thanks very much. Thanks.